Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, evening's webinar, Grand Rounds. Uh, this is uh, the fourth or fifth time we've done this, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. Tonight, uh, we really have a wonderful webinar scheduled uh, this evening, and uh, we have approximately about 1,100 people registered, so I know they'll be bouncing in very shortly. And again, thank you for joining us uh, tonight to listen, to learn, to interact, and that's the goal of these Grand Rounds is for you to chime in with questions as we go. So make sure you use the Q&A room and not the chat room, but type in as the presentation is going on. A couple of announcements, probably one of the most common things that's asked is, um, you know, are these recorded? The, the Grand Rounds is recorded, but not available right now. But we do have a webinar series, and I just finished last Saturday, as a matter of fact, I have to brag on this a little bit. I um, just finished a, an hour and 20 minute um, a webcast, if you will, recorded on open closed chain, EMG, biomechanical analysis, of lower extremity exercises. And I think it's really good. <laughs> I know that sounds bad when you do it yourself, but I gotta be honest with you, all the research and all the information, I, I think you'll really enjoy it. So uh, a lot of work went into it and a lot of research, uh, I met, might add a lot of evidence base. So you can go to this website, Northeast Seminars or what you see below. Um, one more announcement, next week, we're sliding into Saturday. I know this is a Tuesday night. It was a little difficult for people and so forth, but it'll be Saturday, June 13th, and uh, Grand Rounds will be with Matt Perventure. Uh, Matt is an orthopedic surgeon at the Stedman Hawkins Clinic in Vail. Uh, he's gonna talk about shoulder instability and bone loss, which he's probably the world's authority on. And he's also gonna talk about what happens with an ACL patient who has a lax knee, not a fail graft, but basically a micro fail graph, and what's the osseous uh, complications. And it's really an interesting case. We've talked about it. I talked to Matt on the phone this morning about it, as a matter of fact. And I actually have a college basketball player with the same problem, ironically. And I don't want to give it away, but it's probably not what you think. It's not an articular cartilage problem. So uh, this evening, without further ado, let me uh, introduce our guest, which uh, I couldn't be more pleased to have this evening. Uh, a uh, great deal of respect for this gentleman. Uh, he's a professor and vice chairman of, in the Department of Orthopedics at, uh, at Rush University Medical School. He's chair of surgery at Rush Oak Park Hospital, team physician for the Chicago White Sox, the Chicago Bulls, um, a lot of the universities <laughs> he's involved in in Chicago as well. He's president of ANA, which is the North American Arthroscopy Association. Uh, he's an expert physician. Uh, probably, in my opinion, the world's most knowledgeable person of articular cartilage and what we're going to talk about this evening. He's, he's probably published over 400 articles at least on this particular topic of articular cartilage uh, and this whole dilemma that we have. We're also going to talk about rotator cuffs as well. And you don't have to go very far to, to see things like this. All these people in this picture had articular cartilage problems that cut their career short, unfortunately. Um, and half of them I dealt with, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm going to be listening and learning and taking notes. And this guy has taught me so much through the years. Dr. Cole has certainly been a mentor to me as so many people on this uh, webinar. And there's articles written on this in the newspapers, especially in the NBA, this problem of, of injuries, the articular cartilage. And the analogy I use, it's like having a Ferrari in your garage, but it's leaking oil. Uh, you got the souped up performance thing and it's just not hitting on all cylinders and it may not last because of it. So without further ado, uh, again, Dr. Cole, we really appreciate you taking time. We know you got a hectic schedule and thanks so much for, for joining us this evening. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, and good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I always enjoy these, and this has been um, this has been a, uh, a a really interesting transition for all of us who are involved with education. And, and I live in Chicago. I'm at Rush, and in, in my life, I you know, much like Kevin, we probably travel six, eight weeks a year, and um, it's there are some enjoyable aspects of it, uh, but it's also a lot of time away from work and family. And uh, it's been a blessing to have the ability to do these webinars and. I think I've been doing more talks now than I normally would do if we weren't in the midst of uh, the pandemic and all the other things going on in our world. 
but it's, you know, it's nice. I just went out for a run and I had dinner with my family and, uh, and spent an hour doing this, uh, yeah, teaching and interacting with Kevin, which is always one of my favorite things to do. So uh, it's not such a bad gig. I hope all of you are all healthy and uh, your families are healthy and uh, getting through this uh, challenging time and hoping, uh, hopefully seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get there. It's going to be at different paces in different places, but I would say that I, I, I personally am very confident we're going to get there and uh, over the next, uh, who knows, six to 12 months, we'll hopefully feel like things are a bit more normal and maybe sooner than that. Um, Kevin asked, uh, my, my areas of expertise and interest are in shoulder, elbow, and knee, and um, I uh, love the, concept, the, the discussion around uh, cartilage because it's such an uh, interesting decision-making problem. Um, the technical aspects are, are, are enjoyable, uh, but I would say the decision-making is probably some of the most uh, interesting that I have in my practice. Uh, the other is uh, how to manage patients with really massive rotator cuff tears um, and uh, instability. So we, we chose tonight, though, to do a case of an elite athlete who was given me permission to show his case, uh, as well as a, uh, a very active individual with a massive rotator cuff tear. And uh, Kevin and I will kind of toss it back and forth. Um, it's important to understand that uh, when we publish and do research that none of this happens in isolation. Um, I have a, an amazing team of individuals. Uh, uh, we have a prospectively maintained, maintained database that we use for our, our shoulder patients, specifically our arthroplasty and rotator cuff and instability, and we have a very robust database in cartilage. I've had the uh, blessing of being at Rush for my entire career and uh, have performed over 800 osteochondroallografts and 700 meniscal transplants. And having this database has afforded us the opportunity to ask a lot of really interesting questions if you ask me any question tonight about combinations, pathology, uh, prognosis, age, gender, activity level, I could probably answer it. And it would, it would be more than just my level five. Uh, it would be because of the efforts of this team who has done so much, uh, as well as generations around them, uh, to help analyze data and ask some simple questions. Say, what if this, what happens then, and how we can actually talk to our patients. So this is a guy uh, who's, as I say, he's agreed to let me uh, present his case and there's some sound in the background. He is uh, he is uh, was the 82nd pick in the 2013 draft. He was a four-year defensive tackle with, uh, with Tennessee. He was in Michigan for four years at 37 starts and 49 games. He was an, an excellent athlete as a defensive tackle and a two-time state champion and all-American wrestler. And um, he presented to me at the age of 26 uh, with two years of left knee pain. After the season, they examined me and they said, oh, yeah, you got a bucket tear in your meniscus. They just clipped out the meniscus that was flapping back and forth. I was good. I was back on my feet in three months. But, um, you know, two years down the road, it popped back up. I tried stem cells, went up to Toledo, and they took bone marrow out of my hip, PRP. I've never missed a game because of injury. And... I get this knee thing and I'm thinking, you know, I can get through this too. It's just another injury on the list. You know, I've dealt with this, but when I found out it's my bone rubbing on my bone surface, it's just is like something you can't bear. You can't get through it. You can only do it for so long. I did it for a little bit, but I had to tap out. <laughs> Kevin, you know, there's an uh, interesting dilemma when you're managing cartilage problems and high level individuals. And um, the, the fact that he says he cannot play, uh, is, is in, in my mind, a big factor because what I've learned over time is that we can do a reasonably good job uh, with activities of daily living, but when you're trying to get to the level that he wants to get to and cannot play, that's a whole different animal. And I'm curious, you know, you've had the privilege of talking to just hundreds of athletes, and they're very anxious about their career, their livelihood, their craft, and with sufficient pain and, and dysfunction, they can have a very challenging time to get back. Tell me a little bit about the discussions you have with them because you get a lot more time with them than I get. Yeah, no, I think you, I think you bring up the key points, Brian, is, uh, you know, you, we see them and, you know, everyday activities, it may be okay, but it's that day in and day out pounding of practice, especially a lineman like this. This is, looks like a big guy and he's, you know, defensive lineman and so forth. So it's a lot of running and pounding. He's got a lot of weight that he's carrying on that extremity. And, uh, it becomes a little bit of a psychological game in their mind too, where 
they're hurting so much they wonder if they're ever going to get over the hump or is this the end of the career and what can they do? Yeah, and I think the expectations are probably the biggest challenge in terms of managing what we can deliver. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of these guys don't have very abnormal physical exams. He has full range of motion. It hurts when you press along the inner, uh, the inner side. He's got an effusion. Uh, he's in varus, or he's bow-legged, as we say, uh, but he's symmetrical varus. And uh, he has an, a stable ACL exam, and you can see he is a big guy. He's almost 300 pounds. And uh, forget about just BMI. You've got a 300-pound individual here, so we know that most of these symptoms are particularly load-related. And I would argue that weight, while weight loss might be something we can talk about in our recreational individuals, weight loss is not likely uh, uh, something this guy can actually uh, accomplish. Uh, these are his x-rays and you get a sense of how much varus he's in and I think it's important for, for everyone to understand that um, being uh, bow-legged or in varus or valgus is actually uh, what I call low-hanging fruit. In other words, um, most pain is, in the knee anyway, is load related. So when you talk to your patients, they're sitting on the exam table, they don't often have much discomfort. They get off, they walk, they go up and down stairs, they carry a load of laundry, carry their children, their dog, they have more pain. If you put on 100 pounds, you multiply by five to seven, and then you put a little varus in there, and then every heel strike, things go to the medial side of the knee. Um, I, in, in, in recreational or high-level high active patients, but non-elite athletes, I will sometimes prescribe physical therapy. And, uh, and Kevin, I'd like just to give your thoughts. When you're looking at uh, varus versus valgus, who, who are you most, more successful with, and what can you actually do to maybe reduce adduction moments to actually help someone in a non-surgical way. And I, and I don't think it's gonna help with a guy like this, but I'm curious in the real world where you're dealing with something that's much more common, what, what can you offer them? How successful will you be with varus versus valgus? And what is the rehab protocol to potentially dynamically offload them? Yeah, I think you know there's multiple things. Uh, one is meniscus status uh, in these individuals, medial versus lateral. If they have a lateral meniscal tear and lost quite a bit of lateral meniscus and they're in genu valgum, I don't think that's a very good player as far as their knee. They don't just really act very well. They have more pain, it's more chronic, hard to get them over the hump. This gentleman's the opposite. He's in varus and has obviously a medial meniscus, I believe is what he had. Uh, what's nice about this is we can maybe consider an unloader brace. I'd certainly consider orthotics for him, talk to him about his shoe wear, try to get him a little better as far as shock absorption. Uh, with his quads and really take a look at his gait, see if he's got a lateral thrust, how much of a thrust and try to control that as much as possible. You think that there's any, what would you, if you had to work on one muscle group to, and I don't know, I think I know the answer, but I'm not certain. If you had to work on one muscle group to sort of dynamically unload him um, from this, you know, physiologic stance, uh, what would it be? Would it be, you know, vastus lateralis would be the abductors. I yeah. Mean, work on For me, I for me, I think there's a couple. It's hard to say one. I, I don't know that one answer. I would say quads is a shock absorber, sort of like what you have with your car. Uh, so I think that absorbs the load, so your joint's not seeing it all. But for me, it's hip and core. Uh, even a guy this big, many times I've seen people like that, and it's amazing to me. They look strong, but they don't have good stabilization and control proximal. And I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that's this person's yeah. problem. But don't be misled by the size and brute strength that they have because sometimes they're the weakest in the core of their body. They can't control it. No question. I'm, I'm always amazed. And so are they, when you just come to my office, I'll just have them stand on one leg Yep. and on one leg and do a, a short arc squat. And you see how their patella turns in, their foot may turn out, they go into that valgus and you would never expect that from an elite athlete. Uh, this is his MRI. And um, you, what you see here is subcondyledema, which, I would uh, argue that I wouldn't call this a lesion. This is just really a sign of overload. So again, go back to the load phenomenon. If you reduce load, edema can get better. If you increase load, edema gets worse. And we see edema uh, with this hyperintensity near the lesion um, uh, because he doesn't really have the, the ability to shield the deeper subcondyl bone from excessive loads. And likely that's why he's hurting. And you could argue that edema may represent sort of a, a subclinical fracture. Uh, I don't want to call it a contusion or a bruise. It's really a sign that uh, load is being transferred to the deeper surfaces below the cartilage. And if we could manage this and make this normal or reduce the load that's transmitted through the medial side, maybe we can get them to a less painful state. And I think the key word or the operational word is less because we, we really often can't offer these people an off switch 
But what we can do is say it's sort of a light rheostat that reduces their discomfort to a level that maybe they can tolerate their condition and maybe play. Again, very guarded prognosis with a guy um, of this caliber, but uh, he clearly, given his age, desire to continue playing. Uh, if he did nothing, he was not going to play. This is his chance. So, um, Dr. Cole? Yeah, please. Hey, can we go back one? Can I ask you a question or two? Yeah, of course. So, so on those MRIs, are you concerned about the size of the bone bruise? Does that ever come into play? Like how far it's penetrating into the bone itself? No, it doesn't. And I think you know, the, the misnomer is people call this a lesion. And it's not a bone marrow lesion. It's a secondary sign of overload. And what you see here is pretty classic. You see it uh, sort of a higher intensity and focus, and then it kind of peters out as you go for, up in the bone. And that's because the highest loads are right here. So when we're treating the osteochondral unit, you, you don't want to be lulled into believing that, well, we've got to treat the bone marrow lesion. If you can make this a competent load-bearing surface, you can get rid of the edema because it won't be seen load anymore. So our goal is not to get rid of the edema by treating the secondary problem, but treat the primary problem that resulted in edema in the first place. What about okay. lateral? Anything going on lateral? It looks kind of funny there. Um, he is clean there. Yeah, this okay. is lateral meniscus, lateral femoral condyle, lateral tibial plow, he's clean. What you can also see, though, is that his meniscus is foreshortened. In other words, if you look at the volume of meniscus on this one image, you see that he's definitely had a previous medial meniscectomy. So what you're dealing with is, um, what you're dealing with are uh, a problem here of varus, uh, excessive load both by his habitus and his sport, um, meniscal deficient most likely, and a uh, focal cartilage defect that has a subchondral signal. So, uh, Kevin, we kind of went through all this. Is there any additional things you just want to add? I know we had a chance to bring some of this up. Yeah, so let me, let me just say a couple things and, you know, about this gentleman, but also in general, if you see people with articular cartilage, and for that matter, even arthritic knees, I think, I think you want to just consider trying to change the uh, applied load. So a person like Dr. Cole may consider an osteotomy or something like that on individuals. I think we have to consider in, in non-operative and unload or brace. And there's every company has an unloader brace. And I think there's good efficacy for this. There's, there's good studies to prove that they do work. Um, orthotics. So take a look at the person's foot. Look at their ankle flexibility. Look at their great toe. This guy's got to run a little bit. If he's tight in his first metatarsal, he's going to roll in. Um, take a look at quads, uh, core. We talked about that. And the traditional exercises for core aren't going to be, it's going to be more planking and bridging and RDLs and things of that nature that we've talked about. Um, I would also take a look at his flexion. Um, for bigger individuals with, with kind of a tight knee, good stability, we also see quad tightness. And I think they need full range of motion, be able to run and things of that nature. I'm also an advocate of glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. I don't think you have anything to lose as long as you screen them, make sure they're not allergic to shellfish. So for me, a person like this, they would be on glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. Um, as Dr. Cole mentioned, uh, losing weight is not this person's option, but if he were retiring, this would be a, a big conversation that I would have. And I would tell him you gotta stay active, ride a bike, low impact loading, those types of things. Brian, let me throw this one at you before you, you talk about your intervention. This guy's almost the identical guy except the opposite direction. He's in genuine valgum. He's had two failed microfractures. He's got a two by three centimeter defect on his lateral femoral condyle, um, which he floats in and out of. He played at Alabama, and ironically, he was a Tennessee Titan guy too. Um, but he's in Valgus, and he says to me, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I just want to get a couple more years out of my knee. Whatever you tell me to do short of losing weight and changing my job, you know, what do you do with that? What do you do with a valgum knee? Yeah, so, um, you know, the same, it's really the same principles. He, um, you would love not, you would love to do everything possible not to operate on him because you're dealing with this 50 to 75% uh, range of getting him well. And given his size, I, you know, you, I would be very reluctant to do anything without considering we re realign the procedure. So much like the guy that, that, that I'm, the case I'm presenting, I would categorically want to know that every single thing has been tried. And I have found that a valgus on loader brace is pretty well tolerated, maybe more than a varus on loader brace at times. I would make sure that I've exhausted uh, injections, so biologic therapeutics, not to regenerate cartilage, but just to quiet down the joint. I would do everything orally, systemically that I could possibly give him. 
I would strengthen the hell out of him. I would work on all the things you proposed and hope that we can get him serviceable because if I operate on this guy, he's out for a year with no better than a 50 to 70% chance of getting what he wants. This guy's a giant. And uh, uh, so my guy's big. This guy's, this guy's much bigger. Uh, and, you so know what, and you know what happened, Brian? He had to retire. We couldn't get him well enough to play football day in and day out. He retired. He lost about 70 pounds. He's coaching in the suburbs of Birmingham. He's actually back running, and he says his knee feels really good. I believe it, and I think that's the one thing. It's like I often say, like obesity is – I'm not calling him obese, certainly not to his face. But um, I'm, <laughs> uh, obesity, though, is, you know, this has six vital signs. And you and I have lots of examples that in, in the real world, never be afraid to have that conversation because you can take someone who's physiologically, you know, outside the physiologic envelope, as Scott Dye says, and get them in that envelope where the, they don't have to adapt to their world. Uh, they, they've adapted their knee, their body to the world rather than shrinking the world. Why don't you uh, go ahead through that? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead through that? Yep. So I think just to give you, a, you know, uh, what, what the slide basically says is that these things are very common. Um, but it, the, there's a couple of things that are important to understand that despite how common they are, we don't treat them casually. And um, I'm very careful to only treat symptomatic people. We know so little about the natural history of these problems. And despite the fact that 40 to 60% of people walk around with these things, you know, this is like what Atul Gawande says, we're sort of rotting from the inside out as he wrote in uh, Being Mortal, his book Being Mortal. Uh, this is just a fact of life. And if I wanted to do a lot of surgery, I would just get a lot of MRIs and treat a lot of asymptomatic people, much like uh, massive cuff tears, actually. We, we kind of coexist with these things. And the, the, the consequences of what we're treating were really shown in uh, patients who have had ACL injuries, who also had cartilage treatment at the time of their ACL reconstruction. And they, and they certainly looked no worse, did no better at 10 to 12 years to their counterparts who had their defects ignored. So I, I think it's important for all of us to think about treating people for the here and now. Uh, I'm, uh, I would say that probably five to 10 times a week, I get emails from my colleagues and friends uh, saying, look, I found this lesion or I saw this in MRI, what should I do? And I could never make a decision in a vacuum. There's a million questions you have to ask. And you know, the most common answer is do nothing uh, uh, with these lesions. And it's mostly about education and reassurance. So this guy, this is his video, and uh, you can see he's probably meniscal deficient. He does have quite a bit of meniscus, but if you look in the periphery, it's sort of overhanging the edge or almost like it's extruded. You can see his tibia is starting to go, and this is his cartilage defect. So as I said, he's kind of got three problems. He's got this cartilage lesion, the edema behind it, so you know the surface is not structurally sound, right? You know he's missing his meniscus here, and he's got that tibial plateau that's starting to go downhill. So you've got a defect, you've got meniscal treatment, and he's got malalignment. And, you know, what's really interesting is that I think it's easy to make a decision on the defect. Uh, he's had multiple surgeries. It has an osteochondral signal. It's cartilage and bone in terms of, you know, the bone is not probably perfectly healthy. But really to do anything less than an osteochondral allograft in a high-level athlete is probably not the right answer. Uh, but the biggest challenge is what do you do with the meniscal deficiency uh, and how do you think about the malalignment? And, the mal and, and it's often been said that, well, look, if you do an osteotomy in, a, in an NFL player or a collision athlete, they'll never get back. And I and I find that sort of a, it's, it's, a, it's actually, I think, kind of a, a, a silly statement. The reality is, it's the fact that you're doing it in a very challenging clinical problem, not because the osteotomy uh, uh, seals the deal that they never get back. It's you're just dealing with one of the most challenging problems ever in, an, in a painful knee in a young person. You've got malalignment, a cartilage problem, and overload that happens uh, exponentially because you're missing the meniscus. So this decision to do an osteochondriolograph was pretty easy. Uh, the harder decision was what next to do. Do you do the meniscus? Do you do the osteotomy? I think secondarily, the osteotomy is also an easy decision. As I say, that's the lowest hanging fruit because once they heal their osteotomy in four months, there's no reason you've got to hold them back. Uh, we also did bone marrow concentrate. You know, we have some emerging data, uh, although it is clearly not conclusive that using bone marrow concentrate, uh, bone marrow aspirin concentrating and then soaking our osteochondriolographs and also soaking bone graft uh, can induce bone formation, but it's still very early stuff uh, in the subject of a clinical trial. But uh, the, the, the hardest question for him was, you know, the philosophy is what is the least amount we can do to make someone better? And in this instance, I would say that um, I was reluctant to do a meniscal transplant, even though we have a large series and very uh, lar uh, highly active patients. I just felt that that would be the first thing that would go given his size and his sport. But you have to challenge yourself, look, if I don't do enough, he's not going to get well. And I, some would argue that just do an osteotomy. So if you think about this guy, just like your, your, your lineman, I didn't see any x-rays, but 
if they have bipolar disease, I will tell you that an osteotomy is an acceptable operation in isolation. And then I say to myself, well, look, I can do the osteotomy. I feel that that is an easy decision to make, super easy to treat the uh, cartilage uh, with a graft. And, um, and then the decision by me was to stop there. And his osteotomy healed. You can see his graft here. We did a CT scan at six months to assess for integration, as you can see the graft here. And um, uh, this is just, I just want to, you know, I'll go over the basics. And Kevin, you're, you're more than welcome to do it. I, we have, uh, if you want to, you know, Kevin has an amazing uh, uh, library of rehab protocols. Um, we have on my website, BrianColeMD.com, every one of our rehab protocols is broken down into phases. And when we have an athlete, um, we kind of go into more granularity. But it suffice to say, someone says, what's the rehab like? On the early phases, we keep them protected weight-bearing if they're tibial femoral lesions, but the patellar femoral, we let them weight-bear as tolerated uh, for six to eight weeks or protect the weight-bearing. They don't even need a brace, uh, and they will do CPM. And then as far as return to sport, it's generally if they're patellar femoral lesions, they're six months at soonest. If they're femoral condyle lesions, they're eight months. Now, if I just did an osteotomy on him and you want to take a chance, say, look, let, you don't have the timeline, you don't have eight months under your belt, let's, uh, let's, let's give you a shorter recovery time you could do an osteotomy only, trying to get him back at four to five months. If you can't do it, you could arguably go back and do the other procedure, which is the one that actually delayed him till eight months because an osteochondral allograft kind of needs six to eight months to fully integrate without the risk of fracture. Uh, so I would argue, Kevin, and I mentioned your thoughts that most of the rehab for cartilage procedures, you could break down into those which are patellofemoral or tibial femoral. And I would caution you, you do not need to protect weight bearing for tibial femoral lesions if there is no tibial tubercle osteotomy done. Weight bearing restriction is the kiss of death. So the sooner you get a weight bearing, the better. Everything starts working when the weight bearing. And, uh, but you obviously have to protect the biology or the mechanics. And when you do an osteotomy, that's often why we have to, it's a race against time, bone and plate against healing. We protect them. But Kevin, arguably uh, in your experience, you know, look at all the different procedures we do. If you just threw them into buckets, would you generally say, except for how long it takes to feel better, that the phases are roughly similar across the board? Yeah, yeah very much so. And yeah. I think to your point, yeah, separating them, tibial femoral versus patella femoral. And we, I separate them. We separate them here based on size as well uh, and kind of common in procedures like yourself. Um, to, to your point, as far as weight bearing, which I think has always been, you know, a bugaboo, whether it's meniscal surgery, like a meniscal repair or articular cartilage, I think there's always been this guarded long extended periods there are some good studies for the for the uh, therapist to consider uh, one by laura timmerman one of the fellows that we had here out of san francisco she did a great job showing that weight bearing after an articular cartilage procedure the patients did better long term hey dr cole let me ask you a question why is it such a hang up about the osteotomy with the high level athlete well, yeah. what is the concern is it a yeah. fracture is it yeah. healing is it it's a stress funny, you know. It's funny, this, the week I did this, this uh, athlete, I had two of the exact same cases, and I'll share the outcome. But um, uh, they get referred to me because the team physicians are afraid to do it. And it's right. not because they're not amazing physicians. They just honestly don't have, there's, it's a big leap. And, and um, they just, this is one of those operations that I think a lot of them feel more comfortable. Not all, believe me, but will feel more comfortable. Look, I just... Let me go to someone, you know, I, I don't have any, I don't have that, you know, how do I say this? I am a team physician for, you know, a couple of sports, right? But when you look at the, in the, 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 the involvement you have with the system and you look at a procedure that has at best a 75% outcome and has a significant potential complication rate, and if you have a complication, they're not small, they're typically big, right? Non-union fracture infection, they're big, even though they're infrequent. So you can, you can understand why emotionally it's easier to say, look, I'm, this is what I'm going to disconnect myself from. And, you know, both of the physicians who referred to these athletes were, you know, they asked the same question, Kevin. They really were uncomfortable with the concept of doing an osteotomy. And I would argue that the osteotomy is the greatest fact in, pattern in this, in this case. The fact that you have room to breathe to do an osteotomy is the thing that actually made me feel optimistic. And as I said before, I think the concern that really people have to ask themselves the hard question is not that osteotomy is dangerous or, it, or the procedure prevents them from getting back. This is just a really difficult problem that no matter what you throw at them, you're still going to fail 25 to maybe 50% of the time. So you better be sure that this athlete cannot otherwise play in pain uh, for that reason. So it's not something that's implicit or an inherent in the osteotomy. 
is the fact it's just a really challenging uh, problem to, to overcome with any treatment whatsoever in this level athlete. So here's, here's he, he met with me three months, we saw him six months, we saw him nine months. All right, so now you're uh, a little over two months and, uh, after your HTO osteochondrograph. I understand you've been walking and you've done some single leg activities. Were those activities things that you've been less pain before? Definitely. It was stuff that I couldn't even deal with because of how bad the pain was, but now to the point where I get no pain from what I do. Okay. Is there anything you've done that's caused pain? Obviously, you're not running or you're not eating that. Is there anything you've done that used to cause pain that is causing pain? No. Know. Like going up the stairs and stuff, like, you know, I'm doing it a certain way, obviously, because I'm letting it heal, but walking, I can walk now with her and I have issues. I used to can only walk for 20 minutes at a time because it bothered me. So it's, it's feeling really good. Good. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you know, so in this athlete, I'll tell you, uh, Kevin, and, uh, you know, those who are uh, listening, it was a success for everything but football. And mm -hmm. this was a hard one to swallow. Um, the same week I did another guy who was a defense, I think it was a defensive end. He's still playing exact same pathology. He's probably two years out now and he got a great contract and this is not a shortage of motivation. It's just that I just, this is a situation where you've got to be prepared to fail and not meet all your objectives. And, you know, while I know he was very disappointed and would have loved nothing more to play. And I think he may be coaching now. He got really good quality of life with sub NFL activities, but um, it just didn't happen. And yep. I don't have a problem sharing a, you know, I guess I question, you know, what is success and what is failure in a situation like this? And I think success is avoiding a complication and making them better than they were. And a home run uh, would have been getting him back to his craft and his trade. Uh, none of us would have loved to seen it more than, you know, him, his, his uh, significant other, and myself. But, you know, it just didn't happen. And I think that's what we have to be prepared for when you manage these athletes. And frankly, with managing anyone, the easiest patient is one who says, I have problems with routine activities, walking, stair climbing, can't stay active, can't maintain my fitness and health. The hardest ones are when they say, I'm fine with all those things, but I'm not so good when it comes to uh, um, uh, the highest level activity. If that's all they want to get out of the procedure, I often will go the other way. The, the good news with him is he did have problems with more routine things. So I felt like we were giving, we were at least able to deliver something of value, but certainly would have loved to have him be able to get back, but just wasn't the case with this one. Yeah, you know, the analogy is the baseball pitcher that can do anything they want, but they just can't pitch. They can't yeah. throw hard. Right. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? I can play golf. I can, yeah. I, can, I can lift weights. I can do everything. I just can't pitch. Hey, what yeah. do you think caused this guy's problem? I know that's a $10,000 question. Was it a traumatic yeah. injury? Was it what, – what do you think I set think, him off? Uh, I think it was the fact that he started with a menisectomy. And he ended up overloading the tibial femoral joint and his cartilage broke down. As I went through, and this is a great decision-making uh, piece of information, as I went through his history, I knew that his articular cartilage is at his index first of two metastatomy was intact. And then what happens is, and we all see this, is they do beautifully with a simple metastatomy. Then they get six months a year later, they go downhill. And yep. it's not because they have oh, a new meniscal tear on their MRI, which I it always pains me to hear people say, because then you're operating on the assumption, I'll just do another metastatomy and it'll be fine. But what you see is there's an evolution of cartilage and subchondral edema. And while you certainly can try to go back and debride them, usually the second time is a failure absent of a new injury. They just get this insidious onset of symptoms. And it's because the cartilage is breaking down. That's, that's why I think he failed. I, that's why I think he came to me. Why he failed, I think, is just the obvious that you're just dealing with this high, highly varied outcome um, in a very high demand individual physically and by sport. I don't want to get into too much uh, didactics as we'll give ourselves time to do the last case, but we recently looked at this population. I, I had, you know, if you ask me, tell me about osteotomy in an athlete, varus or valgus, tell me about a, a osteotomy meniscal transplant, OA graft, uh, or meniscus transplant with tibial disease. Just ask me any question and I'll tell you based upon you know, how, how we've cut the data. Um, um, and this is a very specific paper that looked at the issue of uh, uh, what do you do in a patient who just gets an OA graft and an osteotomy, high tibial osteotomy, okay? Uh, not femoral, just high tibial. So this exact case, and only 40% went back to the pre-op level. So I'll be honest, I, you know, I've been in practice long enough, and I'm comfortable enough to report our failures and suboptimal outcomes. I think we have to do that. I think it's our responsibility. Um, so you know, if you ask how many were satisfied, 75% were satisfied, yet only 40% achieved that goal. And what was really fascinating, if you ask the athlete, why did we fail to get you back? 
there was a very significant psychological component. I know I see this in baseball and you see it in baseball. They're just fearful of causing, of being re-injured again. And there is an enormous psychological overtone that goes on with this. And, and this is, wasn't true in this particular athlete, because I know for a fact he wanted to go back, uh, but couldn't get up and couldn't do it because of the amount of pain. But um, I will tell you that the, uh, um, uh, the, the number one explanation is the desire to avoid further damage. Uh, and they say, you know what, I've been through so much, I'm just hanging it up, I'll be active, I'll stay fit, uh, avoid heart disease, and live an active life with my family and my kids, and I'm just not gonna play a professional, professional sport. Where's his, where's his pain coming from, Brian? Um, well, I would argue that it's, it's a failure of the organ medially. In other words, it's, it's, it's the medial side of his knee, and it's probably bone, and it's just load because if he's sitting around or walking, going up and down stairs and exercising, he's, got, he's good. But if you ask him to run or shuffle side to side or you know, hit another person who's equal size or greater, and he loads through that medial side, he has a lot of struggle. And it's just load related. And the, you know, the while they're, people say, well, there's no nerve findings in cartilage, nerve endings in cartilage, why do they hurt? It has nothing to do with that. It's the fact that the organ is failed. The, yep. the load is just not tolerated in that patient. When you say organ, you're talking underlying bone, yes. what nourishes the articular cartilage, basically. Yeah, and it's just the joint itself is an organ. When you think about it, we don't have a full understanding of what leads to symptomatology, uh, but it's the bone unit, it's the cartilage, uh, it's the synovium, it's probably proprioception. Um, it could be subtle things like you pointed out, uh, quad deficits, motion loss, all of that stuff. And so... Uh, you know, once it starts going bad, even though you put that allograph in, is there still, you know, that trepidation, that underlying bone is not normal enough to nourish the rest of the articular cartilage, the borders of it? No, I don't worry about it, to be honest. I know okay. people who split, split that discussion up, but I think that, you know, I, I think an osteochondral allograph is a lot like having a knee replacement. It's just a dead graft yep. that shares load. Why do people get with a knee replacement? Get better. They get better because you put a load sharing device in there. Why do they get better when you unload them? Because you reduce the load. Why do they get better when you reduce weight? You reduce the load. So yep. it's all, why do you get better when you put a meniscal transplant in? Because you're sharing the load. So I think we can, and this is good for your business because it gives you, it should give you a lot more work than me, quite frankly. Most yeah. people can get better by modulating things without surgery because it's, quite frankly, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple explanation. It is, it is a load phenomenon, not even biologic in many cases. It's a low and, and one thing I'll say, not so much about this guy, but the everyday patient, if you just change the load just a little bit, I mean, I'll use orthotics where it'll be a two, three degree wedge in their heel to get them off that medial compartment. I'll, I'll boost up the lateral side to shift them laterally. And they'll say, oh man, my knee is much better. And it's yeah. only two degree wedge. I mean, yeah. it's so insignificant, but you're just getting off that, that stress riser, so to speak. One more question. I know we got to move on, yeah, but no uh, the PRP, the orthobiologics, I know he went through that route before. And I know a lot of people, therapists deal with uh, patients who, who get that on a regular basis. What is the PRP designed to do for that particular patient? And what about the bone marrow aspirate? Because those obviously wow. totally different entities. Yeah. In that case, when I'm doing a bony procedure, I would use it solely to, uh, serve as a theoretical augment with growth factors for bony integration. So the osteochondral unit is living cartilage and the bone has to die and sort of reorganize and it doesn't get replaced by creeping substitution. And these will fail as commonly or more by the bone than the cartilage. The cartilage actually does a pretty decent job of living. The hard part is the car is the bone. So um, we think uh, with our early data, we're in the middle of a prospective study with and without bone marrow concentrate by CT scan that the bone marrow concentrate might augment bony incorporation. Similarly, PRP has, in fact, the only FDA indication for PRP is this is augmented bone graft. And uh, PRP, in this setting, I would use for uh, mixing up my bone graft. In this case, I use cancellous chips. Uh, the bone graft is used for the osteotomy. What about preoperatively, though? He had a... Uh... Oh, yeah, different. Yeah, the treatment he had pre-op was designed to modify symptoms. And how does it work there? Uh, I think everyone has to understand we are not regenerating anything. It is solely to, like cortisone or, or oral anti-inflammatories, it's another vehicle to serve as a little pharmacy to deliver growth factors that might inhibit cytokines, might inhibit uh, nociceptive pathways and so forth. But please don't be lulled into believing that we're restoring anything whatsoever when we're doing it as an injection in the office. 
So sometimes the PRP can be an anti-inflammatory and neuromodulate pain, correct? That's my belief. Yes, I agree. Yep. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. Not, but you've done the research, so yeah, and I, I think follow that. What's happening is nothing. It's not going to be permanent, but uh, you can build bridges. And um, my, you know, my go-to now for arthritis is uh, hyaluronic acid and uh, leukocyte four PRP, a series of three. And I, yep. I, I swear by it. It's the little level five, but we have emerging level one and level two data, and that'll be published. Great. Thank you. So should we go on to the shoulder case? Yeah. yeah, why don't we go on to the next case? Because uh, yeah. we're a little bit long. There are a lot of information, so I appreciate that was good. it. Yeah, that was, that was great. I pre the, questions, the questions are awesome, and I, uh, I think that was, we drove, drove home a lot of important points. And as you're booting that up, let me just say... Oh, uh, actually, just, this one I'm pulling up? No, you're pulling this one up. Or am I doing this one? No, you're doing it, Brian. Right, no yep. problem. I got it. I got it. And it, as you're bringing that up, let me just say, uh, just compliment you, and I hope the, the viewers, the participants realize... You know, when Dr. Cole says, you know, if they had a high osteotomy with an allograft, I can tell you what that is, or a microfracture with this, or, or a meniscal transplant, is because his commitment for research. So it's not just doing the work in the OR, but he follows all these patients. And so he can tell you the breakdown, the odds of who's going to do well and who's not, which, again, it's a lot of work, and it's really a commitment. It's a tremendous commitment to uh, clinical excellence, Brian, and, and to uh, add to our our knowledge, you know, and many times the research is the missing link that we don't understand. You know, people just make these anecdotal claims that PRP works, it's going to grow cartilage. All you have to do is go to the internet, um, you know, and, and this fountain of, of youth, but you have a lot of these answers. So, so thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. So this case, I'm just letting you listen in. Lovely woman who uh, I, I got to know pretty well just because she had been through so much with this. How old are you? Sorry, we're here for your right shoulder today, but you are left foot down. Is that correct? How many surgeries have you had on your right shoulder? Have they all been wheelchair cuff repairs? Have any of them made you better? Initially, yes. And when was your last wheelchair cuff repair? Uh, December of 2015. Okay. And injections, physical therapy, have they all failed to deliver what you're looking for? And as far as what you're looking for, what would you say? Uh, I want to get my strength training. I want to help me be able to do the things I do on a daily basis. So activities day living and exercise are difficult because of your shoulder. Okay. And what do you like to do? What are your main exercise activities? Uh, well, I teach group fitness, so I teach strength classes. I teach yoga. I teach hot dog. I do a lot of obstacle course pieces, which I love to do, but I don't really like to do. Uh, I mean, anybody okay, it's all been a struggle because of your right shoulder. Okay, thank you. So you get a sense it's a chronic problem. She's a very active individual, but she's struggling, and and her physical exam uh, is not 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 terrible. Um, she just has, you know, this is one of those tweeners. You know, she's gonna have a tough problem. Uh, she's young. Uh, she's wants to be more active. She actually still teaches, but she's got. In some ways, she's like that professional athlete. You're trying to squeeze something out here. Can we deliver? And this case is controversial. And unfortunately, we're not going to have time to go into, a, you know, some of the nuances of, of it. It's controversial to the extent that some would argue that she's functioning so well. What more can you possibly do for her, given what she's been through? And um, she, you start to see on her x-rays that she's getting some proximal migration. She's maybe, she's not sitting out the front, but, you know, you start to get the sense that you can almost diagnose rotator cuff pathology on a plain x-ray when you see loss of this, what I call, it's like Shenton's line of the shoulder. Normally you should see a nice even circle here, but what, what we're seeing is this is rising upwards. And her MRI is uh, fairly telling because you get a sense that she's got a super and infraspinatus tear and she's retracted right here with very significant muscle atrophy. And um, her other views, her axillary view, the important part about her is that her uh, subscap is intact and her uh, joint is not arthritic. So that's good. She's got that going for her. And um, then you know by her MRI, also I showed you the sagittal. When you look at the outlet view, she has significant atrophy, you know, where it's just replaced uh, in part uh, by um, uh, fatty replacement. So there's lots of options in a patient like this. And um, we repair is something I wouldn't normally do, but people have to remember that repair is possible in uh, some patients. The superior capsule reconstruction, which was the solution for this patient, 
is a great option, but people should never forget that repair is possible. This is an example of a guy who had significant lag signs. You watch him and um, he drops like this. He's almost pseudoparalytic. You get into the tissue quality is awful. His MRI shows terrible atrophy. And you're like, how can I repair, rightfully repair this? And we did. And this is him in three to four months yeah, so after like his this. repair, not an SCR, just a repair. And it's not because I'm so good at repairing them. We just did what everybody else does. And the guy got back. And the point is that people forget uh, that sometimes keeping it simple works. But this woman's different. Uh, she has had several repairs and there's just nobody home. Great cartilage, bare footprint here. There's nothing to fix. So this is a situation where SCR, supercapsular reconstruction, has been a very good solution. Uh, it doesn't have any dynamic function. We get asked a lot, uh, does it stabilize the joint? How did, why does it work if it's a dead piece of collagen which you attach in the glenoid to the humerus and this sounds silly and who would invented this? It really does something very simple. It, 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 it attaches the glenoid to the humerus and prevents superior escape and improves deltoid function. What it really does is it takes a patient that I send to Kevin Kevin does his best to make, so you get, you get people out there, there's 6 million people over the age of 65 who are probably walking around the rotator cuff tear, but none of them know it unless they get an MRI. And if you look at the non-surgical data, probably 85% of them can remain symptom-free. If they become symptomatic and you send them to Kevin, maybe I give them an injection, maybe I don't. But Kevin says, why are you out of balance? Your tear didn't just get bigger. They just became out of balance and decompensated. So you do what you do best. And that's Glenny Humor's scapular plastic strengthening. So I, I want to just give you a, a minute, Kevin. If you know, you know that you can make lots and lots of people better with, with, with chronic pathology, I think this is just a splint to make them enabled to get better with you when they previously couldn't. But what are your basic, what's your basic protocol for the chronic cuff tear that comes to me? I ship them back out of the office back to you because I think you're going to do a better job than me and it'll be a whole lot more cost effective. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> not always, unfortunately. Um, but to your point, you know, humeral heads going up and the scapula is coming down because as they hurt, they start to get more anteriorly dominant, more anterior tilted. So their acromion is coming down. So one of the keys is obviously postural exercises, getting a little bit more flexible in front, pec minor, uh, pec major. But really, as you mentioned, balance. Balance the capsule. If they're tight inferior, they're going to be pushed superior into that hole. And then second is your force couples, infraspinatus, subscap. Even though they have a tear up on top, I think some can do well. Uh, I don't know what percentage, that's a question. But as long as you can get the infraspinatus and teres and the subscap to co-contract and compress. And the lats come into play as well. You know, this one is a tough one, and you pointed this out, is because she's really looking for that extra level of function. Yeah, yeah she's looking that And that's the one that scares me. Yeah, I agree. I, I hopefully won't hurt her. Uh, but, you know, it, I'd say the number one complication in orthopedics is we don't help people. So you got to pick them wisely. So the indications for this is uh, you have to have an irreparable super and infra with an intact subscap and no significant arthritis. And the arthritis is really, really measured on x-ray. We want them to be in this phase where they're not riding up significantly approximately because then the horse is out of the barn. So we've found that you can reduce pseudoparalysis, reduce pain, and improve function, but you can't treat advanced rotator cuff arthropathy with this. You can't improve lost passive motion, and you can't improve strength unrelated to pain. Those are the things that we've kind of learned. Uh, we use a little bit of voodoo for these. We always use VMAC as well uh, as a, a way to improve healing. We have some data now that shows that that may actually do that. Um, the case uh, involves putting a cadaver uh, dermal graft that's about three millimeters thick into the shoulder. And it's really like doing a wheelchair cuff repair. It's, it's kind of a fun operation. Um, once you get good at it, it uh, probably takes about 10 of them. Uh, before you don't have any anxiety at all. And uh, it, it's, it, it's been particularly gratifying. Uh, it's basically a dermal graft between the glenoid and the humerus. And in some, but not all instances, you can make a change like this where you have that sort of loss of Shenton's line where the shoulders were riding up and now they're statically down. Uh, why are they down? Because she's done a really good job in rehab uh, afterwards where she couldn't really adapt pre-surgically. Um, uh, what the, the, the study that Kevin and I were alluding to was this moon study. And uh, basically, I think it's really important to understand that rotator cuff pathology is very common. The day the patient becomes symptomatic is not the day they extended their tear. It's the day they decompensated when they have chronic tears. And our job is to make them recompensate. And 75 to 85% of them can actually do just that 
but the number one factor is actually that they believe physical therapy will work. And that's a really important take home. So you can argue that that's a difficult thing to uh, achieve in a work related injury where they just think they're broken. And I don't understand, I didn't have a tear before. I, I didn't have that massive two tenant tear with fatty atrophy yesterday before I bumped into a wall. And now I've got that. And for me to convince them that Kevin's gonna make them better is uh, oftentimes uh, futile uh, because they're broken. Uh, you gotta really help them understand the natural history of this problem. And that even if I fix it uh, in the Virgin uh, uh, Index case, 25% of them are going to reach here one year anyway. So here she is 28 weeks later. So we know we didn't hurt her. At this point, we're just getting the strength to call the very uh, range of motion and get him back to the normal. Mm -hmm. So I'll just you know go through the rehab. It's a lot. I don't slow them down that much. I mean, you got to get dermis to heal the bone. So maybe it's about an eight-week biology phase. So I don't want to overwhelm it. And remember, this graft is not dynamic. So I just got to get the we got to get the thing to heal uh, so that it will continue. Really have this chemodesis effect for, to prevent proximal migration. So same kind of concept again. This is on BrianCoreMD.com, and Kevin's got probably very similar protocols. Uh, very so, similar. Uh, yeah. So you know, and she so she got her her she got what she wanted. But arguably, when I bring this case to a this case to a panel discussion, I catch a lot of flack because it's two thirds of them will say, you know, I wouldn't touch her, and I get that. I don't. Um, I wouldn't condemn anyone for saying I'm not going to do anything. But I, I got to know her in the office. I knew what her appetite for failure was and how important it was to her to get to the next level. And I had a reasonable de degree of confidence that I wasn't going to hurt her. And those are important features uh, when you're dealing with uncertainty and making decisions. So I think what I'll do is just stop with that and share those results. And you know yep. we have about six minutes, Kevin, and to take some yep. questions. Sure. Yeah. Let me ask you a couple, and then we'll have it for uh, our chat room. Um, with her, her biceps was okay. Let's say her biceps was a what you felt was a pain generator. Where would you go with that? And also her AC joint being a weightlifter. Where would you go with that? Yeah. So the AC joint, I really only treat those who are symptomatic. Um, and um, AC arthritis is extraordinarily common by radiographs, maybe between 40 and 60% of rotator cuff uh, patient, tear patients who come to surgery. Um, so uh, I push, I do the basic things. I mean, I push on it, cross arm reduction, maybe even give them a lidocaine injection as a challenge. And if that uh, produces pain free lidocaine and goes away, uh, I'll do, do a very conservative distal clavicle precision arthroscopically, typically six to eight millimeters. Um, that being said, I ignore most uh, AC joint arthritis as seen radiographically. The biceps and her, she's had two previous surgeries. Uh, uh, I can't remember if, uh, I'll be honest, you said it's fine, but I don't know what it was. I would just tell you this, if you still had a biceps, I would take it and I would do a, I would do a subhectinodesis with an all suture anchor. Uh, I don't, I've, I have done, and you, I know you've seen the same thing, biceps, tenodesis and pitchers and softball players and uh, volleyball players, and I don't have any concern any longer about taking it if I think it's contributing to pain. This is her, I want this to be her last operation before she, God, uh, God forbid, gets a reverse when she's much older. Uh, so I don't want to leave any potential pain generator. So I would have no problem uh, given what her desires are because I know that you can even get someone back with a tenodesis who's a elite athlete, who's a skilled athlete uh, with, 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 with arm conditions. That's a couple of the questions that came in. You hit it on the head about the reverse. And she's a little bit, how old was she, 50? She's like in her 50s. I would never yeah. do a reverse with her. If you look at the literature, less Too than young, 65, right? Well, not less than 65, previous cuff repair without arthritis, that's the highest failure rate in reverse arthroplasty. No way. I would absolutely not touch her if reverse was the only option. I would just say live with it until you're miserable, and then we'll talk about options. Tendon transfer and, is another option, but I wouldn't do a reverse. And you would have no... Uh, no um, hesitation to allow her to go back to weightlifting, golf, swimming, those types of things, correct? None whatsoever. Yep. And Mahada has presented on these at meetings, and he has 70, 80% going back to recreational sports. Is that correct? 
That's correct. Um, and we just were looking up, we have over a hundred now. And I like our series because I, it's going to be three or four surgeons. And I think that's really, when you're looking at the literature, it's nice to see a, a blend of people who are doing these things. Sure. Because it, it, to, to see one surgeon, it, you can't, it's very hard to generalize the results, not just because of the technical aspects, because the decision making of who I pick may be a little bit different than my partner, Nick Verma or Grant Garrigus or or uh, or or, uh, um, or Greg, uh, Greg uh, Nicholson pick, you know. So yep. we all may pick them differently. So when we blend them together, you get a really good sense of how patients do. Okay, I get, got a couple of questions for you. I know we're running out of time for you. Okay. I'm going to stay on until 7:15, but Dr. Cole has to leave for for a commitment. Um, if the first patient, if he could put up with the pain, would you let him play with pain? I do that all the time. That's a great question. And when I give my talk on uh, managing athletes, the first question I ask is, look, if I tell you that doing nothing will not lead to a worse outcome later on, and that there is not a shred of data that you playing your sport will make your disease progress, could you tolerate the dysfunction and pain and play your sport at an acceptable level? That's the first question I ask, because I know that they are in for a six to 12 month recovery with an uncertain future if I operate on them. And, and I, they, they often, in a, in a good percentage of them, absent of the system issues of agents and family and contracts and so forth, if you give them the reassurance they need, they may turn the corner and say, you know what, I hear what you're saying, there's no guarantees, I kind of know what I own, you're telling me I'm not going to make it worse, you could do something later if you need to, I'm going to do my best to play. And that is a very acceptable solution, and in fact, that is the preferred solution in my world. How long does it take for the allograft to, to take probably what they mean is the heel to bone? So I would say we're pro biologically, we are no, a pretty good at six months. It is not about the cartilage. The cartilage is fine, probably fine day one. It's about the bone. I would say that from the, what we know about bone healing, a uh, minimum of six months for patellofemoral lesions, but I'm looking, at, uh, I'm looking at eight months for uh, tibial femoral lesions. So when would be the first time you'd let a person run after an allograft procedure, tibial femoral? Uh, uh, eight months for running for tibial femoral, sometimes earlier, but rarely, and uh, um, six months for patella femoral. Because there's some people that really push that envelope and go much faster, right? I think you can. I just, I, and I have violated that at times, but if they're big, heavy, challenging situation, maybe some early bipolar disease, whatever, I'm a little more, I mean, I'm willing to push where I think I can push, but the last thing you want is fragmentation of bone. So you've got sure. so much stake. Uh, I certainly would never do before six months. An osteochondral autograph, I would do in three, four months. That's different. That's autogenetic bone. But I would never go before, I wouldn't want to go before six months. Uh, hyaluronic acid, you recommended AAOS guideline states that available data does not support the routine use of hyaluronic acid for knee OA. What's yeah, I think, uh, I think it's an obsolete statement when you uh, turn in the mix of data that talks about high molecular weight HA uh, and you redo the analysis with level one, two data, I still think that HA is a treatment strategy and I disagree with that statement. And I believe in the academy it takes the energy if they ever redo it, they would have a different conclusion. I think that's dated and not accurate. Yeah, and I think my experience mirrors yours as well. Uh, what's your opinion of use of subacromial spacers? So it must be a balloon, balloon, right? Yeah, balloon. Yep. Right? Uh, the balloon's an amazing. I give a talk on massive cuff tears. Uh, the balloon, and if you go to my website, we just did one on uh, 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 a seminar in India, and I showed our series. Uh, it's not FDA approved. It's in the process uh, uh, for commercialization, but it has been a magnanimous outcome uh, for our patients who have been part of the clinical study, and I look forward to being released and used responsibly. Same. It works the same, by the way. Uh, it gets my patient able to be treated properly by you. It doesn't have to be permanent. It just pushes them down enough that you can take what's intact that previously wasn't functioning optimally and you can make them well. How, how long does it take for that balloon to, to dissolve and three, break down? I believe it's around three months. Okay. And our results are years or more. And it's not because you need a spacer that's permanent. It's not an arthroplasty of the shoulder. It's a spacer that gets them rehab enabled when they were rehab deficient before. Yep. Um, it is... Uh, question, Bart, it is a Bart Starr jersey behind me. Yes, uh, Bart was uh, fortunate enough to be a patient of mine and uh, 
very privileged to meet the gentleman. He's a wonderful, wonderful person, to say the least. Yeah, uh, Dr. Cole. I would have loved to have met. I think about all the athletes in the world. Barstar would have been one that I would have loved to have met. That's when we have, most, have a beer sometime. I want to hear about that. Yeah, the most positive guy in the world. Go get him. Work out every day. Get up at 5 in the morning. You know, positive with individuals here at our clinic. But anyway, I, I could go on. But anyway, fantastic human being. Uh, Post-operatively, do advocate early rehab or prolonged immobilization after shoulder procedures. I think they're talking about cuffs probably. Yeah, I mean, instability, uh, let's talk, you know, the big stuff, open, ladder J's, start moving right away because you're not protecting anything. Uh, maybe label repair, I'm very careful about the extremes of motion, but I allow closed chain scaffolding right away. Uh, think, you just gotta always think about biology. So if you're a therapist on the line here, um, stay away from the Val and Treat uh, recommendations and always think about the biology. When you, I, I will basically dial in even in my op note to know where things took up tension and so forth. I use it in my first post-op visit to say, here's how I write the script. Think about how long it takes for things to heal. Don't overwhelm it during that time and function within a safe zone where you don't push or pull or tether or tension things that are trying to heal responsibly. The flip side is too little might be too late because tissues love load. So a great therapist will have a good understanding of how much they can push. And I would never expect you guys to do this on your own. And you don't, I know you don't want to nudge or bother a physician, but after you get a couple of their, his or her procedures in your office, get a sense of what you can dial in about pushing just enough to stress the system, but not enough to overwhelm the biology as things are trying to heal due to the sutures or anchors or all the things that are there. Yeah, no, great point, Brian. It's promote healing, but protect the tissue. Yep. <laughs> it's that balancing. Hey, would you do the same procedure on a swimmer? No problem. Yeah, if it's the same condition pathology, I might hedge it and say, look, you may not get the result that you're looking for, uh, as opposed to what she was looking for. Uh, but yeah, I don't think the sport, it, what you have to think about is how will the sport uh, inhibit or promote meeting their expectations? That's how I would use swimming as that fact pattern. Squ swimmers scare me though. I mean, they're a tough well, shoulders. Sure, like a, sure. a gymnast with instability and it's just yeah, same thing. Sure. A um, couple I more. I might, yeah, I might have to blow off if that's okay. To blow off the line, Kevin. I hate to do that to you. Go, Can I ask go, you one more question? Because they're they're blowing up. These Q and As are blowing up here. Sorry. Um, okay, so how do you treat How do you treat night pain? It seems like that's the most aggravating factor that patients tell me. <laughs> yeah, that's daily. number one. No, night pain is the number one reason people choose cuff surgery in my practice and what's been published in the literature. Pain, weakness, and night pain put together makes up ninety percent of the decision making. You tell them that night pain can reliably, but not for sure, go away. And it might be the last thing to go away, but night pain is ubiquitous. We don't know exactly why they have it. My sense is that sensory things go away at night when you're laying in bed and all you've got is your painful shoulder or your achy knee. And during the day, you've got a lot of distractions to your sensory system that you're not perceiving it. Uh, there's probably a lot of other neurologic explanations, but night pain is extraordinarily common. And the reason people choose surgery the good news is with the right problem, the right solution, you can, you can help them. Great. Why don't you go ahead and take off? I'm going to finish up some okay. questions here. Have, because, have a nice evening, everyone. Please be safe. Hey, Dr. Cole, thanks so much uh, for doing this. Really great information as always. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon at a meeting, I hope. I hope so, Kevin. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me, let me uh, answer a few more questions here. Uh, I'm going to go back to the top because some of them were related to uh, – um, uh, exercise. What's your opinion of open and closed chain uh, for, for dealing with the pathologies, loading in particular? Yeah, for me, uh, you know, articular cartilage, um, I'm, a, I'm a closed chain kind of guy. We'll do some open chain uh, knee extensions, but that's just cuff weights. I'm not a big fan of uh, machines for leg extension. In the, uh, the webinar that uh, I just did, uh, the hour long kind of for the series, we got into the biomechanics and the EMG studies that were done here at ASMI, but also at the Mayo Clinic and it really throughout the world. And it's kind of interesting to see the, the shear forces and where they come into play. And I, I get really into that. A lot of times it's not so much that open chain is bad and closed chain is good. It's how you do the exercise, your body position, and the range of motion and load. It all comes down to load and range of motion. So a leg extension from 90 to 40, probably no problem for most lesions. But you start doing terminal knee extension with high load, 
lot of shear, it's gonna beat up your patella. How do you test and assess core strength? I don't know, that's the $10,000 question. And so for me, we do a plank, prone plank. Uh, we do it for time. So there is some data out there that has a, a scoring scale. Uh, again, not to plug another webinar, but in that series, we went over all the objective tests in another webinar for upper extremity and lower extremity. Um, so all the tests that have been used for ACL patients, hop tests, shuttle runs, all those things I describe in that webinar, same thing with the upper extremity. And one of the upper extremity tests is the plank test. And some of the data says you have to hold it for two, three minutes to get a satisfactory grade, depending on uh, who you're reading. Um, so, so anyway, uh, how do we assess it? We eyeball it. There are sensors that you can use. Uh, can you explain osteotomy a little bit more? Well, uh, Dr. Cole had to leave, but uh, basically you're wedging the bone um, and there's opening and closing wedge. Um, I forgot what he did, um, so I apologize for that. But nevertheless, you're just cutting the bone to basically, uh, we well, can't see my hands, unfortunately, I don't think. But anyway, you wedge the bone so you can straighten the tibia or you do an osteotomy on the femoral side. Uh, and they have a very high success rate. Uh, uh, would you use orthotics for that gentleman? Thank you. Uh, would you use orthotics for that gentleman? And the answer is yes. Without a doubt, I would try him in orthotics. I would take a look at what shoes he's wearing. There's various cleats that, that people use now. Uh, some I like and some I really despise. Uh, has he, does he have some recurvatum? I can't answer that. Uh, he does seem like he was tight into flexion. Um, What's your experience with inferior glides with the focus on her internal and external rotation? Okay, so yes, totally agree with that. For me, with that type of shoulder that she has, and uh, Steve uh, Shimoleski is hitting it right on the head, uh, my Polish friend Shimoleski. Um, I don't know if you're related to Terry. Uh, Terry was a colleague of mine here. Now she's up in Minnesota. Hope she's fine up in Minneapolis. But anyway, Terry was one of my fellows years ago. Um, so uh, Steve, I appreciate you being on. But yeah, I think you hit it on the head is that person that, that Dr. Cole talked about that had the hole up on top and was trying to go back to weightlifting. If they're tight below their capsule, it's gonna be pushed superior. So I would do inferior glides on her, grade threes and even grade fours. Uh, would you focus on her internal rotation co-contraction? Bingo, a lot of rhythmic staves. I would do biofeedback on the back of her shoulder uh, to make sure that she's activating her posterior cuff well, repositioning the scapula. And again, how important is thoracic spine? You know, you're three for three there, my friend. Um, I would totally mobilize her T-spine. I'd reposition her posture of her scapula. And I don't think you can reposition the scapula very well if she doesn't have some thoracic spine extension. So if she's kyphotic, which it looked like she was a little bit there. Uh, Dr. Cole didn't have a lot of time for me to kind of ask him certain questions related to her, but she was kind of leaning over, kind of your typical weightlifter type posture. So uh, yes, definitely thoracic spine. Uh, would you, when would you have, when would you wear an unloader brace and for how long? Uh, for me, thank God, I don't have to wear an unloader brace yet. Hopefully I can make it through this uh, without one. Uh, but for him, I would say just wear it for heavy loading. Uh, when you're walking long distances. And that's my hang up with the brace. Many times physicians will say, well, nobody's gonna wear this brace all the time. Well, I don't want them to wear the brace all the time. You wear it when you're going hiking. You may wear it if you're walking, playing golf instead of riding a cart. You may uh, wear it when you're doing exercise, but you don't have to wear it all day. The, the purpose of any of these braces is not to wear 20, 24 seven. So by all means, don't, don't wear it. Uh, what's the dose and brand that you like to use for glucosamine? Full non-disclosure, I have no relationship to glucosamine companies other than I like um, one company, the Nutramax in particular. Uh, they're very friendly to the healthcare provider. And what I mean by that is they'll give you coupons to give your patients for a free 30-day trial. And that's Nutramax out of Baltimore. Um, we use a combination of glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, 1,500 milligrams. 
Uh, it's already comes pre-dosed in a tablet. Um, I tell them usually to take it with meals. The only thing that I've gotten in trouble with with glucosamine is um, if they have a shellfish allergy. So make sure you ask them if they have a shellfish allergy because it's der derived from shellfish. Uh, but they do have a non-shellfish glucosamine. Uh, how long do they use it? Usually for three or four months and see if the inflammation calms down. The glucosamine doesn't heal. It's sort of like PRP, but it can help with um, inflammation. Uh, what brand do we like from an unloader brace? I think whatever company you like the best. Uh, for me, we use a lot of Donjoy products but there are numerous unloader braces out there that are very, very effective. Um, let me scroll down here. We're gonna go for about three or four more minutes because where I'm located, I'm in the heart of Birmingham. We have a, a curfew that actually passed 15 minutes ago. And um, just like a lot of you across the country here in the United States, um, we're dealing with that um, curfew situation because of uh, uh, looting and things of that nature. Um, reconstruction, SCR reconstruction with supraspinatus and subscaft here? No. Uh, the superior capsule reconstruction designed or developed by Mahata out of Japan is basically for a supraspinatus tear. I'm not familiar with it, if you can use that on the subscap or not. I've never heard anybody describe that. I do not think so. So it's a superior border, sort of like a roof on the, uh, on the glenohumeral joint. Uh, let me scroll down. We'll do two more questions real quick. A lot of thank yous and appreciation. So I, I appreciate you all being on uh, for sure. How would you, oops, sorry, somebody just. How would you differentiate structural varus valgus changes in alignment due to joint space loss especially setting with meniscus loss. What they do is weight-bearing x-rays and they look at um, space between the femur and tibia to see if you're losing space in a weight-bearing uh, type of situation. Uh, so that's the number one way. Um, in regards to orthotics, what's your best choice and type of orthotics? You know, again, this is not meant to be endorsements. It's just meant to say what I use and so forth. For me, it's foot management. It's a company out of Baltimore. Uh, they've been very good to me. I think, you know, for me, my bias with companies are, are they good? Do they have a good product? Do they give you good service? And when things go wrong, are they there for you? Uh, in other words, if the brace breaks, <laughs> uh, if the brace doesn't work, if the orthotics aren't quite right and you have to make an adjustment, are they willing to stand behind the product? And so these companies that I'm mentioning, again, they're not endorsement. I have no relationship to Don Joy. I have no relationship to Foot Management, uh, Nutramax. But these are companies that I've had positive experiences with. So I'm not asking you to change and, and use them. I'm just asking you if, if you do, are looking for one, um, you know, obviously this may be one that you may want to consider. Um, and also, if you're not happy with who you're dealing with, if you're not happy with it, switch. You got to be happy. <laughs> you got to be happy with your companies. A um, couple of last things is uh, George from Ar Argentina, San Juan, Ar Argentina. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I, I appreciate your attendance and uh, your kind words about the course. Hopefully it was informative. Uh, another question came in as far as BMAC. That was numerous questions. BMAC is orthopedic slang for bone marrow aspirate. Um, so what they do is they take a big needle and they basically punch it into the iliac crest. Uh, they may do this anterior, ASIS, or they may go posterior. Uh, usually in the OR, it's going to be anterior, and they take some bone marrow aspirate. They centrifuge it down, uh, separate the layers, and they take uh, the bone marrow aspirate that has all the nutrients, and they basically inject it in the, uh, into the joint, whatever it is that you're treating, whether it be a knee or a shoulder. And so consequently, uh, uh, it has effects on healing. People believe that and there is good data. And Dr. Cole has actually done studies on that. Um, and again, I, I just want to compliment him. I know he's not on the, on the call anymore. 
So I wasn't, you know, just saying that because, you know, he was there, but his commitment to research for what he's done is just unbelievable to me. I mean, this gentleman has published over 400 articles and uh, I mean, we can all try to aspire to something of that great lengths, but the reason he can do that is because of his financial commitment to his team and his commitment to research and not just do surgeries and make a lot of money, but give back to our profession. So, uh, you know, again, he's not on the call, but just, uh, you know, maybe send him a thank you or something like that. He's got a fantastic website too. A uh, couple, all right, two more questions. And I don't want to get arrested uh, when I leave the hospital. But uh, <laughs> um, the question is, do I follow the same uh, superior capsular reconstruction as Dr. Cole? Yes, basically, first eight weeks, it's healing. We'll do some postural exercises, light range of motion. Some surgeons that I deal with don't even want you moving the superior capsule reconstruction for six weeks. They can do a little bit of pendulums. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so consequently, uh, at six to eight weeks, now they can start some isometrics and they can also start some, some strengthening at about eight weeks. But it's really low level stuff for the first eight to 12 weeks and then it ramps up. But really, this is a salvage procedure. We didn't get a chance to ask them, but if she were to fail that superior capsule reconstruction, where would she go next? That's the question. And that's why you want to be conservative, because that's a salvage procedure. If she fails, I mean, she's either looking at leaving alone and rehab alone, or maybe a joint replacement. But as Dr. Cole mentioned, she would be very, very early to do that. Um, so uh, again, the, the goal of these webinars, as Wynn had just mentioned, thank you, Wynn, for, for saying that, is to give you some education during this pandemic. Uh, I hope you're all safe and sound. Um, you know, we're in a, a big quandary in 2020, unfortunately, with the coronavirus, our economics, and now uh, you know, the things that are going on related to uh, um, the terrible death of that gentleman up in Minnesota. So I wish you uh, that you're healthy and you're safe. And uh, please uh, stay tuned. As I mentioned, uh, Matt Preventure will come on with me uh, on a Saturday. It'll be uh, uh, very, very entertaining and it'll be very insightful. I promise you, Matt's a fantastic speaker, just like Dr. Cole uh, is and was. We're gonna be talking about bone loss. So in other words, when somebody keeps dislocating, they start to erode away the glenoid. And if you just, if that surgeon just does a bank cart with eroding away glenoid, it has a high failure rate. And with Dr. Preventure championed the, the cause some 10, 15 years ago was fixing that bone loss. And that's what he's gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about that shoulder instability, but we're also gonna talk about a very unique case of a, a gentleman who had an ACL reconstruction and it got loose. The surgeon didn't think it was loose enough to do another one and he kept having bony reactions down his tibia and he developed, I'll give it away, for those of you stuck around, uh, 360 of you stuck around, a lot of you bumped off, but he has a stress reaction. And now the issue is what to do about it. And I have a patient like that right now, a college basketball player who had to have a rod put in her tibia. And I don't know what Matt did with this particular person who was trying to get back to skiing and living a very uh, active life, but it'll be interesting to hear about the stress reaction in the tibia because it's really hard to treat folks. Um, and it's very painful for individuals that are active and athletes. So it'll be really interesting. So again, thank you so much for joining me and Dr. Cole this evening and Chet Paulson. Thank you so much for being an expert uh, webmaster and making us uh, look good this evening. Uh, and to all of you, please, I, I wish you all the, all the best. Stay healthy, stay safe. And uh, I'll see you in about uh, 11 days uh, for another hopefully fantastic webinar like this evening. Thanks so much for joining me. Good night.